During this presentation, I'm going to talk about imaging parameters, reconstruction techniques. I'm going to go through how to assess hip scans, uh, specifically looking at prostheses. I'm going to look at how you can use the CT component to assess the position of the prosthesis on the SPECT CT. And I'm also going to go through the common pathology that we see when we're assessing patients with hip pain. So this is our standard SPEC CT acquisition and reconstruction. The SPEC acquisition is fairly standard. We're using uh, a time per view of eight seconds. The CT component is has a slice thickness of 1.25 millimeters. We're using a Siemens system, so we have uh, care dose uh, 4D applied using a reference MAS of 200 MAS. We're also using an overlapping pitch of 0 0.65. Uh, when we do the CT, we also use extended hand fill scale, uh, and we're also using a higher KV than normal. Um, this is to overcome the noise from the metal work. When we reconstruct the images, we perform an axial, coronal, and sagittal reconstructions. We also perform a small field of view recon of the hip that we're interested in. And we also use slightly thicker slices for the recons uh, when we fuse them for the volume rendering images. One of the challenges when performing SPEC CT images with metalwork is overcoming the artifact from the metal. Uh, as you can see uh, on the image on the left here, there is often quite significant streak artifact from the metal in the prosthesis. If you don't have metal artifact reduction software, then one of the ways of overcoming this is to use extended Hounsville scale. The extended Hounsville scale extends the maximum of the Hounsville units from 4,000 up to 40,000. Uh, if you look at the image on the right, this is using extended Hounsville scale and windowed uh, at a much higher threshold, so you can see the metal work much more clearly. Another trick is to increase your slice thickness, which reduces some of the noise. So if you're reconstructing your images for display, if you can try a five millimeter slice thickness, you might lose some detail, but you will also have less noise. As mentioned previously, when we perform multiplanar reconstructions of the hips, we do a sagittal, axial and coronal reconstructions. However, when we're looking for femoral acetabular impingement, we also do a reconstruction uh, obliquely through the femoral neck. Uh, if we're looking at uh, leg shortening, and this is sometimes we're asked to do this by our, our surgeons, we will do a long length topogram from the pelvis down to the ankle to measure the whole length of the leg. Seeing as we were talking about femoral acetabular impingement, we can uh, go into that here. So when we're looking for femoral acetabular impingement, we perform oblique slices through the femoral neck. The image on the left shows how we can measure the alpha angle. This is essentially the angle uh, between the, the femoral neck and the edge of the femoral head. And we do that by drawing a circle around the femoral head. The center point of that angle uh, acts, the center point of the circle acts as the focal point for the angle between the femoral neck and a point where that circle meets the femoral neck. And that should be less than 55 degrees. So in this case, you can see it's 60 degrees and so there is a slight protrusion or um, convexity of that femoral neck which is likely to be causing some impingement. The other thing we can look at is the center edge angle and that's best done on the coronal image and you draw a line from the center of the femoral head vertically through the acetabulum and then also from the center point of the femoral head to the lateral margin of the acetabulum. And this angle should be between 25 and 39 degrees. If it is more than uh, 39 degrees, then this suggests that 
there may be overcoverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. If it's less than 25 degrees, this is undercoverage. So if there is a convexity of the femoral neck and the alpha angle is measured as greater than 55 degrees, then this suggests that there may be cam impingement. And what is a cam? Well, a cam, as you can see on that animation on the right, is when you have a uh, ellipsoid uh, device that rotates and causes a, an upward uh, motion on the piston. Um, so you can imagine when you've got that slight convexity of the femoral neck that as the hip rotates and moves within the socket, uh, it can impinge on the soft tissues around it. And you can see on the spec CT image on the left that there's focal increased uptake at that site of impingement. Now it impinges also on the acetabulum and on the same patient you can see on that uh, image there on the right there is focal increased uptake in the acetabulum with accelerated degenerative changes with subarticular cystic uh, lesion C. The other type of femoral acetabulum impingement is pincer impingement. And, and this is when you've got overcoverage of the femoral head, uh, uh, osteophytes arising from the margins of the acetabulum, which are overgrowing around the femoral neck, resulting in a, a pincer type of impingement. So on the planar image on the right, all you can see is some subtle low grade uptake around the acetabulum. The spec CT image shows very focal increased uptake uh, posteriorly uh, with associated subarticular cysts on the CT component. One advantage of performing SPEC CT is that we have a CT component so that we can assess the position of the prosthesis. I would urge you to do this routinely. I will always look at the acetabular antiversion on the CT because CT is the best modality for assessing this and uh, this is difficult to see on plain film. I usually also measure the acetabular inclination. When I look at the femoral component, I try to gauge whether there is any significant varus or valgus angulation. If you want to assess for femoral component antiversion, ideally you need to extend your CT down to the knees so you can compare it with the femoral condyles. I don't do this usual, usually in my practice. And this is how I assess acetabular component position. If I want to assess antiversion, I select an axial slice through the middle of the femoral head, and then I draw a line through the posterior ischial spines and a vertical 90 degrees to that line. Then the component, acetabular component, is measured across the face of it as an angle against that 90 degree. And you should have a normal acetabular antiversion of 5 to 25 degrees. If the antiversion is uh, too uh, small, then there is a risk that the prosthesis can dislocate and there is also a risk of impingement. If the antiversion is too uh, large, then there is also likely to be impingement. Inclination is easier to evaluate and can be done on a coronal image, again through the middle of the femoral head, and it is a line drawn through the uh, ischial tuberosities and across the face of the acetabular component. Normal acetabular inclination is 30 to 50 degrees. Again, uh, acetabular inclination of greater than 50 degrees can lead to dislocation, and an inclination of less than 30 degrees can lead to impingement. The next thing I do when I look at the hip prosthesis on spec CT is I look for lucencies. Now it is normal to see a lucency less than two millimeters around the prosthesis. This is commonly seen at the bone cement or bone prosthesis interface. We also have to be a little bit careful about stress shielding. Stress shielding is the phenomenon whereby because of the altered biomechanical stress in the hip because of the presence of the prosthesis, you take loading away from areas such as the greater trochanter, 
and this results in osteoporosis. There is a risk of a periprosthetic fracture at the site because of this. It's important not to confuse stress shielding and the lucency associated with stress shielding with uh, lucencies associated with histiocytic reactions or um, loose aseptic loosening. Let's look at some of the more common complications of hip replacements in a bit more detail. This is the most common complication that we're asked to assess for on a SPECT CT scan. We're used to seeing abnormal uptake on the bone scan, usually two points around the femoral neck and one around the tip of the femoral step. Often on the CT component, we'll see associated osteolysis around the prosthesis where there is movement of the prosthesis uh, resulting in that osteolysis. It's very helpful to assess the component position because it may give you a clue as to why the component is loose. And it's important to determine whether you think the femoral component or the acetabular component is loose because that will affect the surgical management. These are some more examples of femoral component loosening. Again, you can see there's focal increased uptake around the femoral neck, but there is focal intense increased uptake adjacent to the tip of the femoral stem. And this is because the tip of the femoral stem has migrated and is now uh, eroding through the endosteal surface and causing increased stress. And that is why we see those typical three point uptake on the bone scan. Acetabular component loosening is actually much harder to assess on the planar bone scan. Uh, you can see here on the SPEC CT that there is some lucency around the acetabular component. Um, it's greater than two millimeters. It's also irregular and there's associated increased uptake. On the plain film, this type of loosening is very difficult to evaluate and is not specific. Periprosthetic infection has a very different uptake pattern. Uptake is usually much more diffusely distributed around the prosthesis. And on the CT component, we may be able to see things like cortical sclerosis, thickening, uh, and an aggressive periosteal reaction. New bone formation is the hallmark of infection. And when you see that, you must consider infection as a possible cause. Alval or aseptic lymphocyte dominated vasculitis associated lesions are a spectrum of conditions that are related to a reaction to some component of the prosthesis. This is often described in patients with metal on metal hip replacements, which has caused them now to go out of favour. You can see pseudotumours which are presenting as soft tissue collections around the hip joint. In some cases, you might see small foci of metallic artifact within the fluid collections. They can also present as histiocytic reactions and uh, osteolysis within the bone, um, which typically has a scalloped margin. Interestingly, when we look at the spec CT of these scans of these patients with uh, extensive osteolysis due to particle disease, we don't usually see much bone uptake. And this often can indicate that there is alveol or particle disease present. SPEC-CT is very useful at picking up periprosthetic fractures. Uh, as you can see here on the plain film, uh, this was a fracture of the greater trochanter that was missed. On the SPEC CT, you can see that there's clearly increased uptake uh, at the fracture site uh, in keeping with non-union. We can also assess for heterotopic bone formation. We know that heterotopic bone formation is a common complication of joint 
replacements. They can often be seen on plain film. However, there are non-specific finding on plain films. On SPECS ET, you can sometimes see focal uptake at the interface between the heterotopic bone and the native bone. And sometimes you can see impingement due to the fact that you have close approximation of heterotopic bone. Another finding to pick up is acetabular line aware. Strictly speaking, this is not something you would see on the SPECT, but you would see on the CT component. So most hip replacements will have a polyethylene liner that goes between the acetabulum and cups the femoral head. Over time, this plastic liner can wear out and you will notice that the femoral head sits asymmetrically within the acetabulum. And this will indicate that there's liner wear and should be commented on because this will need to be replaced. I want to tell you about two more CT findings that you can pick up on that will indicate impingement. Iliopsoas impingement can be due to retroverted acetabular components. The iliopsoas tendon runs over the anterior aspect of the acetabular component. By measuring the anterior cup overhang, which should be less than 12 millimeters, if you have a retroverted uh, acetabular component and the anterior cup overhang is more than 12 millimeters, the patient may pre be predisposed to iliopsoas impingement. And this is something that you can raise in your report. Another source of impingement in the hip is ischiofemoral impingement. And this is due to a reduced space between the uh, ischium and the lesser trochanter of the femur and can result in compression of the quadratus femoris muscle. And on MRI, you may see tears of the muscles and of the hamstring origin uh, or at least edema within the uh, quadratus space. On the SPEC CT, you may well see focal increased uptake on the lateral aspect of the ischial tuberosity and you can measure the ischiofemoral space and if this is less than 17 millimeters this suggests that there may be possible uh, impingement. So in summary I think we've covered a range of complications of the hip replacement uh, and what can be seen on SPEC CT. I think I've been through how you can assess the SPEC CT and assess for lucencies, what is normal, what is abnormal. And I would urge you to use the CT component to measure the component position, because I think this gives you valuable information over and above, certainly planar nuclear medicine imaging, and can often lead to a diagnosis to help your orthopedic surgeons, even when the SPECT itself is negative. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would welcome any comments or any questions and you can contact me on my email address shown here.